Welcome to an EW Spotlight on Sirius XM. I'm Jessica Shaw. I'm so happy to be here with John Turturro and Susan Sarandon, director, writer, star, and star of The Jesus Rolls, which is out mm -hmm. February 28th. Right. Welcome. Why, why, you. why, right? You're like, right, oh, you're sounding so nonchalant. Yeah. Hot shot. No, it's, it's just good when things are like you finally, they're coming out. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. Tell it me. It exists. Yeah, yeah, it exists. Obviously, this is this is um, your character from Big Lebowski. Yeah. Jesus, a, a beloved character, and I understand you just felt like his story was not done. Well, people kept asking me and writing me things they wanted to see me in the jumpsuit again. So uh, you know, I don't, I don't have the same exact body I had then. So uh, I was a character that was inspired by something I had done on stage, you and look then they good put in it. The jumpsuit. Yeah. You look good uh, in the I'm jumpsuit. still in good shape, but. Uh, I took the character and I put him in a you know a road movie and I think almost all the films I've done, uh, I've directed like five six movies have been sort of love stories in mm -hmm. some ways, and I think this is like sort of a surprising love story, uh, uh, and uh, I've worked with Susan. This is a we've been in a lot of movies together, but it's the third time as a, I work with her as a director, and she's someone I love working with, uh, and she's fantastic in the film yes, in a very yeah. uh, you know. Within a small amount of screen time, she's just, she's really, she just knocks it out of the park. And I, I like making movies about how stupid men are. I think, I, <laughs> I, I think she, she, maybe she'll vouch for me, maybe she won't. And how, you know, certain kinds of men who are interested in women try to understand them, but of course they fail. Uh, uh, and I just think there's something in that that has always really interested me. Because uh, I think I realized early on, and I'm not saying that because now is the kind of the the, uh, the proper politically correct time to say it, that you know a woman is sort of the center uh, of a, of any family and it, and the power station in it, and I think when you're when you see that and you're interested in that uh, as a boy, it, it really it changes the way you look at things, and I think. The idea that people can be a gentleman, you can be a gentleman and and not be educated, and you can be rough and and still be a gentleman. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the characters are actually rough gentlemen. Let's quote Shakespeare. Okay. Susan Armand, stupid, as John just said. Oh well, having sons made me like men more because I realize what they <laughs> go through now to be socialized, and it rips out their souls and their hearts and. So I think very often male artists have had moms that have nurtured them or allowed them the space, which isn't normally given to most guys as they're growing up. And John's a good example of having someone who had a really special mom who encouraged him, but I find that's true a lot. And so are they dumb? Well, they do dumb things, but um, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think there's, a, I feel sorry for men, actually. I feel like they have to live a lie so much of the time. You know, women have to claim their truth, but men have to deny so much of, of who they could be. So mm -hmm. I kind of, uh, and he's right. You know, in this one, the guys are bumbling gentlemen <laughs> who, um, who maybe some of, especially their sexual ways of relating to people and and the way that they talk and everything might be seen as brutish, but at the same time, they're very deferential to trying to make women comfortable. And it, it's a funny, I guess that's what makes it funny, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, let her hold the gun if she wants to hold the gun. Let her have that, <laughs> you know, if it makes her feel good. What? <laughs> you know? So um, I don't, I don't want to alienate half the population by saying men are dumb because I don't They're think it's that simple. They're just 49%, don't worry. 49%. Um, there are some really great men out there. John, what was it like when you called Joel and Ethan Cohen and said, hey, I I want to do something with this character? That well, you they knew that the people were asking, you know, to have sort of a, a second coming, <laughs> you know, a return. A second coming of yeah, Jesus. Of Jesus. And uh, we, we talked about different uh, scenarios. And they liked this scenario because it was 
based on an old French book. And they said, basically, it's a character that we stole from you, and now you take it back, and you put it in this sort of modern remake of an old French film. So it makes perfect sense. And they liked the irreverence of it, mm -hmm. and that it was sort of about classic underachievers. You know, it's very hard to live in the moment. But all of us would like to live in the moment uh, more often. And it's a good reminder that it, there's something precious about it and at the same time it's almost impossible to yeah. do and I thought you know it, it, there was just something about these characters like sort of being on the margins of society like in the Big Lebowski and they form this little unit outside because love or connection is found in the most unlikely places and I think it, sometimes films do a disservice to that they don't show that in in a way, and mm -hmm. I something that interests me. And I thought it would be uh, also the humor would come out of that. But they were really behind it, and they helped me get permission, which was not easy because of the ownership because of the, of the ownership yeah, yeah. of yeah. And they just said that you know I couldn't kill the Jesus, but I I knew that wasn't gonna. Happen. Was that your only rule? Was that their one no, they had lots of kill? they had lots of <laughs> things, and so it was the longest negotiation I've ever been involved in. Really, that's right. The longest thing, and I was because I could have done a character that was similar, like I did in the play. Mm -hmm. But then everyone would have said, "Well, you know, that character kind of sounds like the the, right. the Jesus." And I mm -hmm. thought, anyway, I got permission finally. There is a, a love scene um, with Bobby Cannavale and the two of you. Um, how did that go? Well, Susan is the is a, you know, she's a pro pro. You know, uh, I, it's, like a it's, hooker. Is that what no, you're saying? no, she's a pro. She's such a oh. she. She's. I try to create a, a relaxed environment. And he does. Uh, and I. They put told on, me all about their sexual experiences before we <laughs> shot the scene. Oh, really? I put yeah, on music. I, I put on music. I always put music. What on. What music? Because I think music relaxes people, mm -hmm. and you know. Uh, and you can also get into the rhythm of it. And but it also the tone, more... trying to understand what the tone of the scene is. There was one where I asked for music when we were going into the motel room. Right. And I said, I don't understand. Where do we? And he ran over to this I sound have all guy the and, and have put all. something on. And so that as we went up the stairs, we kind of had an I kind of had an idea of what we were talking about in terms of just the feeling of what he was going for. Because, you know, there's but, only so many scenes, but what you're trying to do with them can vary. Right. I, I mean, I think music, if you write with music, then it's part of the DNA of, mm. the, uh, of, the, uh, of the film. And I, Gene Ammons is a saxophonist that I love, and I played that. Uh, and it, it really helps. It, it, it makes you less self-conscious. And then also we had to figure out how long was she going to kiss Bobby and, you know, Who's Bobby was Jane, who's Gap Jane? Yeah, he was a bit of a ball hog the first take, and I said, "Well, Bobby, you know, you have to share." Who's balls? And, and so we, then we decided to just uh, kind of. I just tapped Susan, and whenever I tapped her, she very like wrestling. elegantly just I gave up. Just moved to the other person, and she just was, you know, it's like a little dance. Right, that, that's right, what right. it is. Yeah. What else is on your threesome mixtape? A uh, mind mixing movie with the, Susan? The no, like what? What else do you play as a director? Like you've got some sax music. I, I any music that I've written, uh, you know, the, the script to, or I will ask an actor if they have to do. Uh, I asked an actress once; she had to do a really emotional scene, and I said, "Forget about everything I wrote down. Cross it all out." And I said, "Just put on, you know, would you like some music? You know," uh, and it was. And she put some music, you know, in her ear. I mm -hmm. didn't know what it was. She asked for it, and it really helped her do this uh, thing. I, I would like to try to help people and create an environment where uh, they can forget that everyone's watching. Right, right. So right. it's whatever. If you need a, if you want a certain song, I'll put it on. But I'll bring my 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 material too. Mm -hmm. and when I was doing King of the Gypsies, Shelley Winters had a tape deck that she would. You know, they say, "All right, quiet, everybody, quiet," and then you'd hear, "Bring in the clowns," yeah. <laughs> and it, 
after about the third day, right. people were ready to kill her. You know, right, you'd hear right. her bring it's in. It's better in an uh, earpiece. Oh, she yes. She had an earpiece. She, we, it was, she was yeah. ahead of her time yeah. with the music. But some sometimes this really bad or a song that's say not a really good song means something to you right. when you were 10 years old. And yeah, yeah. It, it'll just release the floodgates. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting when someone has to cry in a movie because in real life, People do everything not to cry, mm -hmm. and and so sometimes you watch a movie and you see someone cry, and you're never moved by it. But you watch a documentary and you see the person holding on for dear life that they don't want to cry, and then they do, and that's the trick yeah. to not give people results like you know, like you're a trained you know, yeah, a seal or something like that, and you, you it's kind of reverse psychology that way. The cast of this movie, in addition to the two of you, was incredible. I mentioned Bobby Cannavale, Audrey Tattoo, Pete Davidson, John Hamm, Sonia Braga, mm. Christopher Walken. I mean, just, it, it's, do you just, at this point, call, you've worked with so many people in the industry, do you call them and say, hey, I'm well, doing this? Well, sometimes people do. I mean, Susan, I love to work with. I'd love to write Susan like, like a, like a role from the beginning to the end of something, you know, which she did one time for me, uh, brilliantly. And, uh, I mean, I like, Honestly, it's easier to work a lot of times with actresses for me than it is with actors. Because some guys, they, not the people in this movie, but some, they bring in their whole kind of machismo, you know, baggage. Mm -hmm. And I, it's like, that's hard to get through. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just. Susan just brings Penny. She brings. No. Susan's is, great to the crew. She's great to everybody. She is. John is so uh, confident and also so playful. So you have permission to make really big mistakes, which is so liberating as an actor. Mm -hmm. And um, you can trust him completely. And plus, you really have fun. And usually, I mean, I'd never been in a movie where there was a lot of money. So I don't know what you'd be like <laughs> for if we had time. I bet it would be more fun. It'd be even more fun. <laughs> because you're working pretty fast. And you know, you're all hanging out together because you really don't have a dressing room or whatever. So. Uh, that kind of thing, that kind of rare experience, I'll, I always say yes no matter what be with John because I know that it's going to be special. Well, it's a big part of our lives. Our experiences yeah. are important yeah. when we work together. It's not just the result, and you want to have a good result, but I don't want to have... I've worked with people who have been miserable and yeah. been abusive and just... I just don't, I don't want to be in that situation, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put anyone else in that situation. <laughs>
fun and then there's all these obstacles that you have to uh you know what's the difference between filming a love scene for both of you now as opposed to doing it earlier in your in your career i always have to die after i've had sex now. <laughs> Well, well, she's done a lot of love scenes. <laughs> I have. Yeah, and a lot of really good love scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have. Really good love scenes. I, I, they have to be scenes. I mean, the, that's right. the, the thing that's difficult is when you don't understand why that piece is in, and then you're just trying to hide behind the other person's body all the time. And But you have to have a director who, first of all, isn't afraid, because mm-hmm. some of them are, and uh, I mean afraid of sex. And how to shoot it, and and you have to really know what the point, what you're trying to, because they're not all the same. So you have to decide what that particular thing is, is adding to the story, adding right. to the characters. And once you decide that, it's a little bit different. I have to, the the sex in the movie never feels gratuitous, and it always feels uh, it's crucial to the plot of the movie. Right. Um. So it, it never. Well, there's there, there are scenes, there's obstacles, yeah. there's mm-hmm. problems in mm-hmm. the scenes. You know, there's. It, it, there, and I think that yeah, it has to be a real scene. What is your when you think about shooting love scenes like that? What is like when what are what are your favorite scenes in film, like love scenes in film or sex scenes in film that you think are yes, I'd like to do something like that. A lot of scenes that's probably Susan has done in the past. <laughs> uh, uh, I think there are just actors that you. It could be an old movie. I mean, it can be. There, I mean, one of the, one of the sexiest uh, scenes I've seen recently in a movie is a movie that was made in uh, 1940, The Lady Eve, mm-hmm. and Barbara Stanwyck oh. is ru- rubbing Henry Fonda's head as she's she's a con artist and he's a, a multi you know millionaire and she's you know she's going to take him to the cleaners and what she does with his hair in her hands, it's just. It's hilarious and really sexy, and it's a fantastic scene. And I, I'm a huge, huge Barbara Stanwyck fan. Yeah, and uh, so it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be just, you know, an overt right uh, uh, scene. But mm-hmm. I think Susan in Atlantic City with Burt Lancaster when he says, "I watch you." Mm-hmm. That scene, that's a great scene. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. both great in the scene, but it's so unusual. And he seems to be in the vulnerable situation, and she's kind of, you know, it, it, it reverses their the normal positions. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, really, that's a scene that I remember a lot. John, if Susan said when you call, she's like, you had me at hello kind of thing, like she'll do whatever you call her, who's that director for you? Oh, Joel and Ethan. Though. Joel and Ethan. I mean, I would definitely do anything for Joel and Ethan. I would too. Would you tell yeah. them that? Yes, I would. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I would. imagine it, when Matt Reeves calls to say, "Hey, will you be in the Batman?" To we play had a conversation. Like- we had to have some conversations. But uh-huh. he's, you know, I'm looking forward to working with him. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't worked with him yet. Right, so right. You never know when you work with people. Right. You know, sometimes the nicest person. You know, used to be then they would like change. Which I was on the set, I was like, whoa, you know, uh, but. Each experience is different. Mm-hmm. And also how someone deals under pressure with their crew is very important to me. Right. They can kind of tolerate you because you're in everything. But if they're shouting and yelling or impatient or right. mean to the crew, right. I find that very difficult. Just I just find that difficult and that sometimes that happens. Right. Because it's a lot. You have to make... A That's million right. decisions every day. Right. And it's all about compromise and priorities. And it's a big, big job being yeah. with And I've lived with a few directors, and it goes home with you, and it lasts for f- ever. Oh, are you allowed to say that? I you know. are. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so, you know, it can wear you down, and right. it really is a test of character that someone can hold their own, stay focused, be passionate at 7 o'clock at night about where the car is going to be in the background of the shot, stuff like that, that as an actor, you, you just have to keep your bubble up. But a director is really constantly on, has to be alert, right? Yep. John, what was it like when you put on Jesus's clothing, the hair? Um, well, I worked out for about a year before I did it, like really hard, you know. And I was I was training with my salsa teacher, Idelka, and she was basically got some good moves pushing me, also, pushing yeah. me around the entire time and telling me not to step on her feet. She would always say to me, "John, look at me. 
look at me when you dance like this. And I was like, okay, Delka, all right. Uh, so, you know, you just you get back into it, and then uh, uh, and then then you're doing it. That's it. You know. I mean, it's it's actually based on a real person. I don't think not that many people know about. Does that. he know that? He's dead now. Oh, but uh, uh, yes, well, maybe at the time when I did the play, yes. And he had gotten out of prison, and I, I based the sound of the guy on a real person. And yeah. so he knew at one point that you were Yeah, doing, but it was on was stage, and it was very high, I, and it was hard to do a high voice and, be, and project at the public theater. And, uh, but it was, it was inspired by this conversation I had with him uh, uh, over lunch. Was and, he a bowler? Uh, uh, no, he wasn't a bowler. No, okay. no, no, but um, he was an ex-con. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't like get, you know, when I when I take things from people, they don't right. that doesn't all it's have to literal. line yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes an honest person can be used as a criminal. Was there just a feeling of tremendous joy when you're standing there? It's about forty minutes in, and we see Jesus with a bowling ball in his hand. And any Lebowski fans are, are well, I had to do that for. I had to give them something. You know, I mean that. The whole thing we did the big Lebowski. I was just kind of fooling around to make Joel and Ethan laugh. I actually didn't think they were going to put all that stuff in to it, but they did. And when they, you know, I was a little embarrassed when I first saw it. I was like, oh no, I can't believe. But I was doing it because they're my friends, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to make them laugh. But, but John is very comfortable with improvising there was there was a scene where it started raining and romance and cigarettes and that's a musical and we were listening to music and then all of a sudden it started raining and they just got a bunch of umbrellas and we started dancing with umbrellas and then john started dancing through the scene and that's all in the movie yeah i mean you you, you have to you know be alert to the moment and uh try to turn it into an advantage instead of just freezing and i think uh you know, if you've prepared enough, then you can respond uh, spontaneously. Well, you, know? you can see the Jesus Rolls in theaters February 28th. John Turturro and Susan Sarandon, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.